Awareness that God is calling us into a relationship with Him. And the imperative has to do with our, in our study, is that faith has everything to do with our our trust and our loyalty to God, not simply our acknowledgement of certain factors, certain truths. By the same token, there are some things that are fundamental in our in our grasp of, of Scripture itself. And when you begin dealing with the, the subjects of Scripture, there are many and they're vast. Now, I, my personal view is is sometimes we make a mistake. We'll we'll study a passage, we'll study a topic, and we'll line up passage after passage after passage after passage, but we don't really master any of them. But in the, in our study, we looked primarily for, for quite a while at Isaiah 53. Uh, Isaiah 53 is is singular about one topic, and what is it? Suffering servant. The suffering servant of God who was bruised, wounded, offended. Uh, he, he suffered on the cross and he died. And the resurrection is only hinted at in a couple of places in Isaiah 53, but it is there. And the exact statement that God prolonged his days. Then we've turned from there to 1 Corinthians 15. And the topic there, of course, is the resurrection. The resurrection of Christ. And we've looked at the language uh, with regard to what Paul said he preached. Now, <clears throat> there's no need of us having a difficulty with the section of what the gospel. The gospel is what we believe, but the gospel is also what is to be obeyed. It's rather intriguing. If you look up the word faith in Scripture, you'll find it there several hundred times. You'll find that the word itself is pistuo, and a fundamental meaning of the word faith is that it is trust that culminates in obedience if obedience is required. Well, now that's easy to get a hold of. What can an individual who reads the Bible do with a biblical fact? Believe it. He can believe it or reject it. Uh, what about the promises? What can the person who believes Scripture, what can he do with a promise? Trust the one that made the promise to keep it. <clears throat> Trust the one who made the promise to keep it. All right. What can faith do with the command? Obey it. But what if you don't obey it? Reject it. And if you're not obedient, that's unbelief. It's rather intriguing the way the third chapter of Hebrews ends. That's not my conclusion. That's what the Hebrew writer says in the in the end of chapter three. They could not enter in because of unbelief they were disobedient and there's evidence of their unbelief but as you look at the language of 1 Corinthians 15 there are so many points to be made with regard to what transpired uh, in, in the life of the Apostle Paul as he writes this uh, he talks about the fact that uh, we are now if, if Christ is not risen what is true? that's his argument if Christ is not risen what is true? Our faith is vain. We are still where? Still in our sins. Still in our, we're still lost. We're still in our sins. And if in this life only we have hope, what are we? Most miserable. The most. We are the people who are the most to be pitied. Why? Because we proclaim, we teach, we advance the concept of the resurrection, the significance of the resurrection. So there, there are the two major points of our discussion. And in this 15th chapter, I wanted to visit just for a moment see if you had any question on 1 Corinthians 15 there's some rather imperative language but again with verse 15 uh, verse 51 chapter 15 verse 51 and what Paul says there is this corruptible what must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. immortality. <clears throat> What's going to happen to the body? Back to dust. Goes back to the dust. That's the emphasis of Scripture. What about the spirit? Turns to God and gave it. And you got that out of interesting place. The book of Ecclesiastes. The spirit returns to God who gave it. The spirit does not go to the to the tomb. 
but the spirit and the body are separated. The body goes back to the dust. The spirit goes back to God who gave it. But in the resurrection, what kind of body are we going to have? We're going to have a body. That's interesting. We're going to have a body. What kind of body, John? Spiritual body. Spiritual. We have borne the image of the earthly. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. The eternal. We're going to bear that. That is the emphasis of it. Now, in adapting ourselves to accepting the premises of Isaiah 53, 1 Corinthians 15, where do we go now for a study? We're going to look at the sermons in the book of Acts. Well, we're just going to put all these pieces. Someone says what you're doing now is you're, you're laying the foundation and you're going to set up the, the superstructure. Then you're going to flesh it out, if you will, or finish it out. And that's what we're going to do. Now, in this outline that I gave you in exercise number 8, I did not cover all of the uh, sermons in the book of Acts. Uh, if you want to add some to that list, you can easily enough. In fact, we'll help you now. We've got the sermon in Acts 2, and who's the preacher? Peter. Peter. Simon Peter. We've got a sermon in Acts 3, who's the preacher? Peter. Simon Peter. We've got uh, a sermon in Acts chapter 8, and who's the preacher there? Philip. And he's preaching to yes. one man. In Acts 10, we have another sermon. Who's the preacher? Peter. Simon Peter, the apostle. And he's preaching to Cornelius. The household of Cornelius, who happened to be a Gentile, Gentile convert. He became a Gentile. He was a Gentile, became a convert to Christ. And there's the emphasis. Now, what's rather interesting, and if you've done some homework on this section, you've got some things that you are acquainted with from these sections. You've heard the sermons. You, you, you probably have never heard of something on Acts 2, have you? No. Or Acts 8? Never. You've never been guilty of preaching one either, right? right? Well, if you, if you study the book of Acts, there are some events, and I always thought of it, when you look at history, the point is upon the place, and then the person, then the event. But in Scripture, it's the person, it's the place, it is the event, and then it's the content of the lesson that is presented. And the content is there. Now, there's name some other sermons that are in the book of Acts. Chapter-wise, otherwise. Stephen. Mm-hmm. Stephen. Uh, the first original production of Jewel Miller. First production of what? Jewel Miller. Film oh. strips. <clears throat> you ever look to see the Jewel Miller film strips? My, my. You can sit there and just reference in Jewel Miller's film strips in the first three. You can reference almost every single thing that Stephen did in Acts chapter 7. At the conclusion of the sermon, they had an invitation song, and how many responded? Mm-hmm. The stoning. They, 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 <laughs> they all responded. They responded. They were angry, furious with him. And uh, had they stoned him to death. Tragedy? Yes. Except for who? Stephen. Stephen. He went on to be with God. Give me another sermon in the book of Acts. Paul Barnabas. Where? I had to look it up. But they're in there. <laughs> I got you had one in Acts 17 with the Athenians. Yeah. Bar yeah. I tell you what, fellas, if you ever have to teach a class or preach a sermon, you will not do wrong to pick up Paul's sermon. And it is the most concise, straightforward, and full <clears throat> sermon you'll find in the in, in the world. And the subject in Acts 17 is different. What is the subject in Acts 17 on Mars Hill? God was. God is. And they listened to him until he said, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because... Why? What's God done? He's point of day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained in that he has given assurance unto all men, in that he has done what? Raised him from the dead. Raised him from the dead. And the audience listened till he started talking about the resurrection, and then there was a major dispute. Acts 17 is a different kind of sermon, but it finally comes around to 
Christ, His resurrection, but it talks about the resurrection in a different way. The resurrection is the guarantee of the day of judgment. That's the locus of the language of Acts 17. Another sermon in the book of Acts. I'll leave you to wrestle yeah. with it. You're going to find that the Apostle Paul, his sermons are not recorded that extensively. But he does make a defense standing at the on the steps up to the place where he's going to be incarcerated in Jerusalem. He makes a defense there. Later on, he's going to make a defense to Festus and to Felix and to Agrippa. Yeah. And you're going to find from chapter 24 through 26 of the book of Acts, you're going to find his defense. And his defense is fabulous sermonic material. He's not just preaching a sermon. That's the point I'd like to make. We're accustomed to going to church and hearing a what? A sermon. A sermon. And some men get up and they have to say something. (laughs) <laughs> they don't have anything to say, but they have to say. Pardon me for saying that. But uh, I had a friend of mine who used to call me on Saturday night. Hey, Ronald, can you give me an outline for tomorrow morning? So I got to where I would make, this is early early on, I'd like to have an onion skin copy made of my sermon outline, and I just mail it to him. So he didn't call me on Saturday night anymore after that. But I say, Stanley, how are you going to he said, well, your outlines are so concise and so full, all I've got to do is take it to the pulpit and, and read it. Now, since I brought that up, I'll tell another story. There was He was he was going to be gone, so he asked if I would have someone that could fill in for him. So I said, well, that was Monday. I said, well, yes. So I, I got it together, and I, I called this fellow that I thought was teaching our young people. I said, would you like to go down to this place and preach? He said, well... I don't know whether I can or not. I said, I'll give you an outline. We'll work on it this week. So he worked all week on this outline. I worked over it with him a couple of times. He goes down there and he gets up to preach. And guess what was laying on the pulpit? An onion skin copy of the same sermon outline. He called me all in a dither. He said, what am I going to do? I said, just preach it. I said, they won't re- re- you'll preach it enough differently that uh, they won't catch it anyway. Nobody caught it. Well, the reason they didn't is because this fellow had left it laying up there had not preached it yet, so he couldn't preach it now. <laughs> but my point is, is we sometimes have ourselves get to thinking that, you know, what we're dealing with is a sermon. We do well if we're going to, in the obligation of teaching or preaching, to do what we're going to do this morning, look carefully to a text and master that text and preach that text. And let Peter be the voice in Acts 2 and Acts 3. And uh, Stephen be the voice in Acts 7. And you begin dealing with the sermon sermon that is there in in the other places, Acts 10. Let that be what leads you. Let people know this. It's fundamental that we obtain the, 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 the point that is made in this particular section. Now, you're pretty well acquainted with Acts 2 if you heard a sermon on Acts 3. You're preach one on Acts 3. Time or two. Time or two. Acts 4. Acts 8. We've all heard the one on the sermon preached to the eunuch. All we know, however, in Acts chapter 8 is that he's riding along reading from Isaiah, Isaiah what? 53. 53. But he didn't know it was chapter 53 at the time. He didn't know the location. <laughs> He did not know the Lord. He was reading, and the, in fact, the record says he, the passage we're reading was this. And uh, what was the what was the eunuch's question? How can I understand it except somebody guide me? Guide me. Then he said, "Who is this man talking about? Is he talking about himself or some other man?" And beginning at the same scripture, who did what did Philip do? Preach unto him Jesus. He preached unto him Jesus. Now. Here's a point of conversation, but also a salient point. You may, if you preach Jesus, what do you preach? Truth. What truths? Death, burial, resurrection. There's more to it than that, though, isn't there? I would think that he began 
possibly with the fact that the prophets spoke of the fact that God was going to send a Savior. And then he would talk about Christ's birth, where he was born. Born of a what? A virgin. Matthew 1. Reared where? Where did he grow up? Nazareth. And uh, began his preaching after, at what age? Twelve, I guess. No, no, no. He began, he conversed with the lawyers of the law when he was twelve. Thirty, maybe. Thirty? Yeah. Not maybe. Why would I be so definite? (laughs) Well, tell us, Ron. (laughs) (laughs) In Jewish culture, a young man was bar mitzvah. 12 to 14 years of age and he was recognized with the responsibilities of manhood to conduct himself a certain way but he was not did not have the privileges of manhood including speaking publicly including in a leadership role until he was 30 years of age now while I'm on that how long did Christ's personal ministry last? three, and a half. three years three and a half, three and a half. Why are you so adamant about to have? <laughs> Daniel told us he was going to be cut off in the middle of the week. Got it? Now you get that carry up, won't you? Yeah. <laughs> Cut him off in the middle of the week. Three and a half, three and a half years of ministry. And then you have his death, his burial, his resurrection, the reason of it, the purpose of it. They came along and all of a sudden they come to a certain water and the man says, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Where in the world did that subject come up? If you preach Christ, you preach the facts about Christ, the ministry of Christ, and then you preach the promises and the commands of Christ. That's the only place it could have possibly come in. And since I've got you on that, where did Jesus say anything about baptism? Mark 16, 16. Mark 16, 15, 16. Mm-hmm. The Great Commission according to Mark. Where else? Matthew 28. Matthew 28. 19 through 20. 19 through 20. But verse 18, he says, All power and all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go preach where? All the world. world. And baptize them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then when you get through with that, you do what? Teach them to observe all things. Whatsoever I have commanded you, and I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, his emphasis is, is rather clear and rather replete. And you go through the language, Acts chapter 10, we're going to have to spend some time there. In fact, John, you may get to do that. Uh, Acts chapter 10. Good. And we'll go from there. But I want to go to Acts 2 this morning, and I'm giving you uh, a more extensive outline from which to work uh, on Acts chapter 2. And I'll lay that aside, and uh, we'll work from there. We'll go with this. Uh, we're going to look and take an in-depth look at, at the first sermon. Well, why? Because this is fundamental. No apology is needed. One man said, well, Acts 2.38 is your favorite passage. I said, you don't like it? <laughs> you know why he didn't like it? It didn't teach what he wanted it to teach. Exactly. I grew up in a religion that I was taught mm-hmm. some 24 to 25 passages on justification by faith. <laughs> And they added the word only. And they always taught that the word for in Acts 2.38, the word for means because of. Well, that's what's interesting. The word is the word... What is the word in in Acts 2? John, you got to come in. It's unto from the Greek word ex, E-I-S, and it means unto, or so that you can receive. Unto, toward... Can't read my writing, but I put it on the wall. Right. Mm-hmm. This is the word ace. Ace. It's into, it appears over a hundred and seventy times in the New Testament. It is never rendered because of. Go ahead. The word for in Acts two thirty eight. The denominations use this illustration to prove that it means because of. Yeah. If you see. 
a wanted poster. Jesse James wanted for bank robbery. Yeah. How do you take that word for? Is it because he has committed bank robbery or so he can go commit bank robbery? Mm -hmm. Well, they, of course, it's because he has committed bank robbery. That's the argument they'll use to make the word for in Acts 2.38 mean because of. Well, let's go to a passage that may help us out. Matthew 26, 28. Matthew 26, 28. I'll, I'll re-emphasize. The word ace is never translated because. Or because of. Never. Now, our word for, like on Jesse James' wanted poster, it can be because of. That's English. But this is the original word, E-I-S. Right. Here's this. Matthew 26, 28. Who's got it? I have it here. Read it. Read it soon. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, what do you have in that particular passage that's identical to what you have in Acts 2.38? For the remission of sins. The identical expression. Mm -hmm. Did Christ die on the cross because our sins are forgiven? No. no. In order to or toward, unto the forgiveness of our sins. That is, that is why Christ died on the cross. Uh, and Matthew 26, 28 is the parallel in the English and in the Greek. It's the same identical expression for the remission of sins. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to the language and do some study here in this section. First of all, in Acts 2, you have the event itself involving the apostles involving them to receiving the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And cloven tongues like as a fire. Was it cloven tongues of fire? No, it was like fire. Appeared and sat upon each of them. And the emphasis that is given, there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Was it a rushing mighty wind? No. It sounded like it, but it wasn't. There appeared divided tongues as a fire that sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Fill in the word tongue. What does that word tongue mean? Language. 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 How do we know? Well, read the context. That's all it could be. Go right on through it. As the Spirit gave them utterance. And then it gives you a delineation of how many groups of Jews... All the Jews, the Jews were scattered all over the world, but in the known world. And the only group that spoke only Aramaic or Hebrew were what group? Peter's group. Basically, the Galileans. The people who lived in the environs of that, of that nation. The rest of them were bilingual. The Jew who lived in Rome spoke Italian and Hebrew. They came together. They all shared the Hebrew language. Here on this occasion, the ones that are speaking, the ones that are speaking are all Galileans. Well, how do they know they're Galileans? Because of their accent or the way they speak. And? Their language. And? The way they Come dress. Here, the way they dress. <laughs> the way they dress. The way they dress. You've got a cosmopolitan audience showing up in their tuxedos and three-piece suits. Pardon that illustration. But they were characterized by the dress from which they came. From <coughs> Egypt, from the Coptic nations, from all those areas, they dressed. What about the Galileans? Their country what? Their country bumpkins. Yes. Pardon me for saying it that way. What language do they speak? Aramaic or Hebrew. That's all they speak. But on this occasion... What's happening? The sound was a noise abroad. The people came together. And verse 7 says, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? They had to be. Now, someone said, Well, you're not sure about that, are you? You have to use your, your, your noggin. You have to use your thinking powers. How did they know they were Galileans? If there was not something that marked them out as Galileans. And what marks people out as Galileans? Well, it could have been their haircut, but more than likely it was their attire. Now, they went on, they were, they were amazed and marveled, 
But there were some who had an answer to it. Verse 12, what could this mean? These men are amazed and marveled because they're, they're hearing the wonderful works of God being spoken to them. And they said, they mocking said. There's a difference between somebody and they said and they mocking said. What's the difference? Being snide about it. Being snide. They, they might have said, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> They were mocking said, these men are full of what? And that's an interesting phrase in and of itself. That would equal our phrase saying he's drunk on Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi-Cola doesn't make you drunk, does it? I've never tasted alcohol of any kind. But uh, not bragging about that, just stating a fact. But I've heard people laugh, oh, he's just drunk on Pepsi. That means that he's... For some reason, he's just, he's just weird. Uh, they're just weird. That's equal to what they're saying here. But Peter stood up with the eleven. So we've got a group identified as the Galileans. We've got a group here identified as the eleven. He's one of the twelve. And there's the emphasis that is given in the language. He raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my word. These are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. One man said to me, he said, well, that wouldn't prove anything. In that day and age it did. Verse 16 is a critical text. Because what's going to happen to you when you get down to verse 17 through 21 there are a number of things you're going to need to look at and collate to put in proper perspective. And you have this statement here with regard to his declaration. This is... Next word. Your translation. Verse 16. This is what... Does anyone have a translation that says this is that which? Well, that's what the phrase means. This is what Joel prophesied. Joel made a prophecy. The prophecy is found where? Joel chapter 2. 28 through 32. There's the prophecy. Now, here's what's going to happen. But whatever else you do, you need to underline one word in verse that, that section, verse 16. And what word do you need to underline? Now, interesting, I'll say it this way. He does not say this is part of what Joel said. He did not say this is the beginning of what Joel prophesied. This is part of what Joel prophesied. He said categorically, this is what Joel prophesied. All right? Now, sometimes the language of Scripture is rather exacting in detail, and I lost the cap to my pen. I'll be all right later. I won't put it in my pocket. Mm -hmm. But I began dealing with this whole premise with regard, this is what Joel prophesied. Well, let's <coughs> read the reading. What did Joel say? It shall come to pass in the last days. Heard that phrase before? The last days? Hebrews chapter 1, God now now in the last days speaks to us through His Son. Last days. How is the word last days used in Scripture? Christian age. Alright. Some would argue, and there's reason to consider their argument, <clears throat> that sometimes the word last days is talking about the end of the Jewish age. That's an argument. But categorically, the Christian age is the last dispensation of time. The last dispensation, the last age. Therefore, the last day. You have the patriarchal age, began with Adam, and went all the way down to the cross. Huh? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. It went from Adam all the way down to the cross for what group? The Gentile. All other nations. Now there's an interruption, there's a parenthesis. Because the patriarchal age gave way to the Mosaic. mosaical age, and the mosaical age 
involved and was pointedly involved with God's government of what group of people? Jewish people. The Jews. The descendants of Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob. Those are the people. The tribes of, of Judah. And you begin looking at all of that. In the last days, so whatever he's talking about here, the last days has to do with either the end of the Jewish age or the beginning of the Christian age. Which one do you prefer? Do some thinking. Which one seems the most obvious to you, John? Ask the question again. Does the word last days refer to the end of the Jewish dispensation or the beginning of the Christian dispensation? In this passage? Yeah. Well, you have a preference. What's going to happen at the beginning of the Christian age? I'm thinking it's Christian age. <coughs> okay. yeah. You answered the question. What's going to happen at the, what's John say, Joel say? Here is what's going to happen at the beginning of the Christian age. Oh, for out of my spirit on all flesh. Okay. Now what's happened to the law? The law existed from Moses till Christ died on the cross, and what happened when Christ died on the cross? What happened to the law? It was nailed to the cross. It was nailed to the cross. Colossians two, fourteen through seventeen. Ephesians 2, 14 through 19. Romans 7, 1 through 4. It was nailed to the cross. 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, deals with the end of the law. What one book repeatedly, again and again and again, establishes what happened to the law of Moses? You ready? Book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews. You've got all that information about what happened to the law. What's interesting is most religious groups today, they take a flat view of Scripture. Genesis all the way through Matthew all the way through they're all level ground they're not you've got God dealing with families God dealing with a nation God dealing with the Jews they're not a race they're a nation people sometimes forget that now in the Christian age God is dealing with all men through through Jesus Christ that's the emphasis what about the law the law Tell me what you know about the Ten Commandments. God gave them to whom? Moses. Written on what? Stone. Stone. And what happened to the Ten Commandments? What happened to the Jewish law? Colossians 2 says it was blotted out. It was nailed to the cross. And then he goes and says, "Do not, Therefore do not let anyone judge you in respect of... And name the things he said. Do not let anyone sit in judgment of you in the Christian age with regard to feast, feast days, holiday. holiday, holy days, holy day. or Sabbaths. Yeah. We had a lady who really got bent out of shape because she didn't believe that she thought the first day of the week was the Christian Sabbath. Well, the word Sabbath, let's do some homework. What does the word Sabbath actually derive from and mean? What means Sabbath? Seventh. Seventh. It's Seventh. It was the Seventh day. And God gave that law to the Jews as the law. But He gave us a recognition of the fact that the law is over. It's done. In fact, we are no longer married to the law (coughs) on the Seventh. Uh, We're dead to the law. Uh, the emphasis is given in the book of Hebrews repeatedly. But now he says that it's come to pass in the last days. He's going to do something. That's verse 4. The language of verse 17, pardon me. What does he say in verse 7? It shall come to pass in the last days, says God. What's he going to do? I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Question. Is this all flesh? Does it mean all mankind are chosen representatives? All. All. Can't get aller than all is what you usually say. All mankind. Verse 33 says, I will pour out of my spirit in those days. Uh, Look at verse 33 again. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He poured out that which you... Next word. 
Now. Now what? See and hear. See and hear. All right. What happened on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit was poured out on who? Huh? All. Literally, it was poured out on. I thought we might bother here. The Holy Spirit was poured out on who? Definitely poured out on Peter because he spoke a message. It was poured out on the apostles, wasn't it? The apostles, yeah. mm-hmm. Poured out on the apostles. Why was it poured out on the apostles? They stand as representative heads of the new humanity God is going to bring into existence in and through Jesus Christ. Now let's go back to Acts 1. I'd like to read it this way, but I'll ask you to read it this way. Um, John, you got a good voice. You can be heard. I want you to read this section here, uh, 1 through 8, and I want you to emphasize the collective pronouns. If you don't read it right, I'll tell you to read it again. Uh, chapter 1, 1 through 8. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandment to the apostles whom he Whoops. whom he had chosen. Whom? Whom is a collective pronoun. Whom? whom who's whom? The last few words you read. To the apostles. Whom I'll read that verse for you and chosen. you'll get it right. You'll get it right now. I'm going to read the last part of it. He, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandment to the apostles whom He had chosen. Go ahead and read the next verse and put the emphasis on the... To whom... Alright, now go to the next verse. To the next verse. No, no, read that. To whom He also presented Himself alive after His suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them All right. 40 days, or during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You're in our role. Verse 4. And being assembled together with them, All right. he commanded them not to <laughs> depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. Well, well, you. Heard well, you have heard from me. <laughs> I'm not collecting, but it is. It's, it stands for a group. You. You're close. You, you're close. Go ahead. Next slide. <laughs> For John truly baptized with water, but you <laughs> shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Read verse 8 real good. But you All right. shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Alright. You see why I had you read it that way? An A minus at least? <laughs> well, you're running close to a good A right there. Okay, good. Uh, you began dealing, dealing with this whole thing though. What do you come away from reading it that way? You, what happens if we read and we read and we read it's plain vanilla. I got news for you. This is loaded. Who was promised that they were going to receive <coughs> power when the Holy Spirit came upon them? The apostles. the apostles. Acts two begins with a man who's taken the place of Judas. He's numbered with the twelve, and then chapter two begins, and they, who the twelve, were all with one accord. Speaking to the apostles. What kind of car do you drive? Ride a bicycle. No. <laughs> what kind of car do you drive? Altima. No? All right. Uh-huh. If you'd had an accord, we'd have gotten in this verse, but they were all in one accord. <laughs> they were two driving it. They were one accord. <laughs> well, the whole point is who, who is who is it that received the outpouring? <clears throat> who, it, who received the power on the day of Pentecost? And how does that connect with what Joel is saying? <coughs> Now, what you have is you have a specific statement. It should come to pass in the last days. I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. You've got to deal with the question. 
Is this all mankind? Did all mankind receive the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? No. Only through the representatives, yes. the apostles. And the apostles qualified on what basis? They were all what? Witnesses. Witnesses. And they're going to testify as witnesses. He emphasizes, I will pour out of my Spirit in those days. Did God pour out of His Spirit on the day of Pentecost? <laughs> Peter says, this is that. What you're seeing and hearing, this is what Joel prophesied. Go a little further. Question or comment? This is clear, I trust. Go ahead, John. Uh, he said, I will pour out of my Spirit. Pour out my Spirit upon the Spirit. All flesh out. Wait a minute. Let me go back and read again. 17 and 33, both of them say that. That I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh. Now, of course, I'm reading this in English in the New King James Version. Yeah, that's right. I will pour out of my Spirit. What is he going to pour out of his spirit? His spirit? I'm pouring my spirit out of my spirit? Well, he's going to pour out that manifestation of the spirit. And the spirit is going to be manifest in a fashion. Well, what do we have? We have sound as of a rushing mighty wind. We have cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon the apostles. Right. The apostles began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Right. And, and the, Go ahead. I'm, I'm, when, I, when I read this, I, I see me with my coffee cup. I'm pouring out of my coffee cup. Well, what am I pouring out? Well, I'm not pouring Content. out my coffee cup. I'm pouring out the coffee, Content. my contents. Content. So His Spirit is filled with His Spirit. That's right. Well, and two, you have the people that in the denomination world they'll take that a step further and begin to expand what that uh, um, appears like you know speaking in tones mm-hmm. some gibberish language that people, or I say gibberish not yeah. a language but just talking right. where you can't understand and that gets into the rabbit chase this morning we haven't got time for but yeah. um, it's amazing what people will try to claim is pouring right. out of the spirit you know and yeah. um there's no new revelations today, of course, from anybody. And, um, you know, it's just amazing what they expanded to. You know. Yeah, they expanded. But let's go to this here for a minute. I will pour out of my Spirit in those days. And verse 33 is rather central. We are witnesses. Now, we refers to what persons? Verse 33. <coughs> The only witnesses of that were there qualified to testify were the apostles. The apostles. Okay, now drop down. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. That's the promise of verse 20. Were signs and wonders performed on the day of Pentecost? Yeah. Yes. We've got them. Yeah. Right there in the first four, five verses. So you've got the answer given to them, but were there other were there other events that preceded the day of Pentecost? Signs and wonders that preceded this event. Mm-hmm. What were they? What happened when Christ died on the cross? Yeah. From yeah. noon to three o'clock, what was it? Yeah. Darkness. 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 Earthquake. The, the sun was darkened. The earthquake. The veil of the temple was torn in two. The veil of the temple. All kinds of various. The dead came up in uh, the grave and walked around. All right. Mm-hmm. Who would like to have seen that? Mm-hmm. All right. Now, it's rather interesting. You've got this flow of thought. Then verse 7 points in another direction. It shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. I will pour out of my Spirit and it will come to pass. You got the connection? I will pour out of my Spirit and it shall come to pass. What's going to come to pass? Verse 21. What's going to come to pass? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Whoever calls... Prior to that moment, did anyone call upon the name of the Lord in order to be saved? Which, verse if, if you isolate that verse, it makes for a perfect false doctrine. <coughs> if you isolate it. But now what is involved in calling on the name of the Lord? Obedience. We'll get to that. We're going to cover this next week, Lord willing. <laughs> John, you may be delayed getting into the other sermons. That's all right. We'll work on some outlines for when you. When is the next day you're not going to be here? I'll be the 14th. I'll be in Gadsden. I was speaking in Gadsden.